One of these days, one of these days, Alice. So we know whose child you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> These are real people who really wrote Richard Dawkins this? This is my conclusion. You, it has to be true. You have to, you have to have it as your previous Funny, video. Yeah. This is part of your apologetic. Now I know a ton more, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is a mission statement. Vision podcast. We're going to talk about everything wrong with Christian apologetics, but we're going to talk about some things. This is going to be a fun discussion. You're going to want to stay tuned. All sorts of nuggets are going to come out in this from two academics. We have Dr. Joshua Bowen, an Assyriologist, and you could say, wouldn't you call yourself somewhat of a Hebrew Bible scholar in a way? I mean, I'd let somebody else do that. <laughs> okay, but you wouldn't put that on your like a CV. Like I am. I have a minor. I have a minor in Hebrew Bible and my PhD, and I got a master's in theology and Old Testament studies. So okay. whatever you, that means. You like a three time PhD in apologetics, right? I mean, I that. Shh. Okay. Shh. Keep and then the down low. we got Doctor Kill here. He has like seventeen bodies on him. Uh, you have the they're invisible teardrops, oh, the invisible right? Invisible teardrops. Yes. Yeah, because you see the bandana, and we know yeah, what that means. And then the symbol on your shirt. Yeah, it's so we know it's, whose child you are. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, you're obviously a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. I like obviously and obviously. Yeah, Hebrew tell. Bible scholar. I definitely categorize that, especially with our conversations about where a Dead Sea Scroll scholar is situated in that yeah. kind of conversation. Well, my, my degree says religions and theology, though. So, you know, depending on who you talk to, I'm I'm like a, a, a nobody who doesn't know anything. Because it's like a, <laughs> Another it's like a fake degree from a PhD yeah. in, in apologetics, of yeah, course. Absolutely. Um, and so we're going to talk about these apologetics today. Uh, you've done a documentary actually responding to. To, about Josh McDowell's yeah, narrative, yeah. we we've talked before, and both you off air, Dr. Josh and Kip, have brought up the idea in our previous recording about apologists start with their conclusion, mm. and they get upset when that gets called out online. In fact, they try to say, "No, we don't quit saying we start with our conclusion. It's the evidence that we're going for." So let's the spearhead this as we approach the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Like to say from the outset, I don't know that there's, I don't know of any way that somebody can come to data without an interpretive framework. Mm -hmm. You just, you just have one, mm -hmm. right? As much as you might try, it's like trying to get rid of bias. Like you're not going to do it. You, but the, the key is to try to be as objective as possible when you do that. But this idea that, no, we're not starting with a conclusion, it, Based on your interpretive framework, you're already going a particular direction. You're seeing the data through that lens. And that's why I think it's so important to try to engage with different interpretive frameworks to view the data and to say, do, do, does this interpretive framework account for the data points better? But this idea that we, we, we're just coming to the data pure. No, you're, you're not. No, you, Nobody is. You can't. I mean, just look at the, I mean, the word apologetics is derived from the the Greek word apologia, and it appears in uh, is it is it Second Peter? I don't know nothing. Uh, you don't know that. <laughs> so it's uh, it, I believe it appears in in Second Peter. You always give a defense for for what you for the hope that you have within you. So uh, it is the uh, it's so hard to take anyone seriously when they say that, no, 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 we're not starting from a conclusion. When the... <laughs> the posturing <laughs> is like this. First right? Peter 3.15. First Peter 3.15. First Peter 3.15, thank you. So it's built into the term. <laughs> like you're starting from, from the position of belief. Of acceptance of this is this is my conclusion. Now I have to give evidence for it. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Um, so you're already. It's not even like a. It's not even like almost a, a, a knowledge thing we would say where you're learning. It's this hope that's inside you. You're already trying yeah. to defend, and I would almost call that an experience. For most people absolutely i went to a uh I, I and i think this is this is something that, that that is is quite common um 
I went I went to a uh, like a Christian discipleship school right out of right out of high school in uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, and we spent one of the things that that they that everyone focused on and they they kind of drilled into us was developing your own personal testimony and learning crafting your narrative um and we worked on it and we practiced it and we had uh and we had a uh like a point at the end of the at the end of the term where everybody stood up and 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 gave their testimony and we received feedback mm. on you know what we what people liked and what we should do differently so i think there's there's a there's a focus on 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 telling the story right as and this is part of your apologetic this is what i focused on when i made that documentary of josh mcdowell right was just how much his own personal story came to inform uh his his um i guess his his uh his, his whole method uh for promoting the gospel yeah uh, well i mean i i think that so often, um, just to sort of piggyback on that, so often there's this idea among um, Christian apologists in particular, where they will say, well, "We're not, you know, we're not starting with our conclusion. What we've done is we've we've done all this research, we've done all this work, and we've come to this conclusion, right?" And but the reality is that, as as you're sort of intimating here, they've had an experience. Right. And when you when you talk to me, really, it's so few people that I interact with that are speaking to me with any kind of honesty are saying I was like logic into my Christianity. Right. (laughs) I did. It was just overwhelming. The evidence from archaeology, it proved to me like there are just so few people that say that. No, they say, look, I I I had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. And, and, uh, you know, I I know that he's my Lord and Savior. and, And hey, you know what? That's great. But I think being able to recognize that, because what happens then is you, you, you come then to the data with that conclusion yeah. in mind. And so I have a friend, and that's what I was looking up here. But you know, he wrote his dissertation on Daniel and mm-hmm. looking at the, the, the figure, uh, uh, potential figure of Saxeries II as a potential for um, Darius the Mede. But he has this note. And I wrote in the book that it's far from objective, right? Because listen to what he says. Most importantly, Daniel was a prophet who wrote infallibly under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, whereas extra-biblical sources for the life of Cyrus are ordinary human writings. Since God was speaking through Daniel as he wrote, the book of Daniel is not to be viewed as an account of uncertain trustworthiness, whose veracity is to be judged by other data, but rather must be the standard by which all other accounts are measured. You, you, there's, there's nowhere to go from there. No. That is the essence of Christian apologetics. Right? And you know, oh. I have to say something, Josh, and, and Kip, this is me again, right, trying to analyze and get into the mind. There are several smart uh, and I say smart as in like these people are well read. They've read a lot of uh, uh, church fathers. I like to say they've read a lot of material and they've mainly focused on with that really leaning into stuff. I've, like I hear people who lean into Lydia and Tim McGrew. Okay. And they're yeah. like, I think these guys are like the like really up there in the top 10 scholars on New Testament studies. I got a friend of mine, Jeff Tripp, who they're going to be, you know, hearing from soon who did a critique of Bauckham on his eyewitness testimony stuff. Oh, wow. He wrote a book actually criticizing Bauckham's John eyewitness, the gospel of John, like so many things. Jesus doesn't even get his own words right in that gospel compared to his own words in earlier places. But the people who are his enemies do, he goes in down into the nitty gritty into the Greek and source material and stuff like a whole textual critic would. But I one day he he had a medical procedure taking place, so he's laid up for a few days. He said, "What's that book called again?" And so I ended up getting him the book, uh, Lydia McGrew's book, and I said, "Hey, read this book since you got the time. Start reading." And he started reading it. We had a phone conversation. I'm not going to go into the details because I want to tease people until they see. But he was just like 
she just outright says nothing else matters but the New Testament. And like, I'm not, I don't care about any other sources. I'm literally only caring about this. Right. It's outright coming forward. And these very sophisticated, they write well, they're, shoot, their grammar is way better than mine. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't even get sentences right half the time. And I'm listening to them and I'm going, you are so driven in, in, I just have to think bias. I mean, yeah. you're, you, it has to be true. You have to, you have to have it as your previous Funny, video. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, I can't. It does have to be true though, because because of the emotional attachment to it, yeah. right? Like this is one of the things that you'll find in common. I I think with most with most of 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 the more popular apologists is is this feature, right? There is a strong emotional attachment at the start. Um, Lee Strobel. Had, had his wife had a conversion experience that greatly influenced him in 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 his pursuit. Um, Josh McDowell, similar sort of thing. He had this he he had this 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 rotten upbringing as a child and and ended up coming to faith through through these these friendships he made with these super nice people at college. Right, uh, you know I've heard Mike Winger talk about his 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 terrible childhood and and just how much. How much love and affection he received as a teenager in church which which led him to christ and and i mean you could go you could go on and on about how how these people have made an investment an emo, a, a deep emotional investment uh that at this point feel prompted to defend hmm. at all costs it yeah. seems yeah um, so it really doesn't like like what you're saying is true. Nothing else really matters at this point except for holding on to what the, this this deep emotional attachment that uh, that people have that come through faith. I want to add real quick, Josh. I know you could probably add to this. I feel like, and this is just my subjective little opinion here. That the more sophisticated apologists that we run into, I'll put like inspiring philosophy on this list, things like that, are actually trying to use, uh, I would use this term, negotiate. They're trying to negotiate with the sophisticated, actual critical scholarship out there in some way. Mm. Now, they're not willing to negotiate in many ways, yeah. but they're trying to negotiate with the more like, let's go to John Walton, let's stop act, acting like ex nihilo or, or oh, yeah. You know, let's find a way to get a guy who's smart enough, who's 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 playing with real serious academic stuff. He gets stuff right often. Yeah, Maybe yeah. Michael Heiser on yeah, certain things, good for example. example. Is. Um, and then they and then there's some things where you go, dude, really? Yeah. You know, like you really buy like Michael Heiser lived that worldview. He really thought there's things going on like right now as we speak, and you know the whole nine. So, so no, I was going to say at this point you have to ask the question. Who are these people speaking to? Are, is does this become now is, at at this point at this level that we're talking about, where you're you're having to develop these these sophisticated um, arguments to maintain this this worldview? Is this still about uh, defending your faith to critics, or is this more about standing for? those who are like-minded in your own community and defending everybody and everything that they believe against becoming the the tribe or the village um hero and 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 we are in in a lot of respects the the local dragon that needs to be slain sure and they're defending it and so there's a lot of people who aren't doing that rigorous work even on the level of people like Heiser or Walton or whoever it might be that you might throw in the category, because I tend to think Walton's even more sure. uh, than than what you see with Heiser. So, um, but like I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, they're trying to negotiate. Those are the ones that are pretty sophisticated yeah. in their approach. But I heard it once said by a scholar, and I'm not going to name names, but they they said something that I thought was really interesting about apologetics. You mentioned it's just like. For our community, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of preaching it to my choir. I yeah. think that's true. I also think it's it might be true ghetto. that they think it's intellectual, and they're like, hey, yeah. if it's true, then it's obviously logical, rational. It's the most sensical, because it's true. Starting with that 
that, that experience yeah. leading them there. Yeah. But I really think that the real reason that might boil down for a lot of them, this is me psychoanalyzing, but I do think it's the case, is they're convincing themselves. Sure. Mm. They're trying to tell that person in the mirror, hey, what you're believing in isn't silly. Put those doubts down. You have the most rational, true belief in the world and convincing themselves. I did not go on this path to listen to Mike Lico Michael, what Mike Lacona, I heard him once or twice, but he was younger when I first started to get into the scene. It was um, William Lane Craig. It was Ravi yeah. Zacharias. It was these guys. I read The Case for Christ and The Case for Creator, Lee Strobel. These guys were really trying to, and it was my journey at first to know that it was true for myself. Mm. Yeah. Along that path, I started going, oh, I can argue this online, and I can convince others to try and get Christians on the right track, but also stand up to skeptics and tell them why I'm not an idiot for believing in my particular fundamentalist position yeah, yeah. or something. You know, because I think they feel that we think they're idiots and we don't. I think that there is a sense in which the brain is kind of hijacked, though, sure. to argue for things that, again, to your point of the, the grip, you know. But I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's something that happens when you dedicate enough time to a particular uh, subject matter to like get a PhD in it. There's something that happens and it's you realize the vast nature of the data that needs to be mastered in order to understand it. And one of the things and I'm thinking back to my 26 years as a fundamentalist evangelical <laughs> When I was like two thirds of the way through my master's degree, I, and even before that, but maybe up to that point, uh, I would have felt and did feel at times comfortable walking and marching in to any pastor, any scholar, walking in and saying, I know what all the books on your shelf say but you don't know what I'm getting ready to tell you. I was a mid-axe dispensationalist, right? So like I could, I could go through the Bible and like, like shout out all these verses, right? This connects to this, connects to this, and this develops this, and this proves this, and this connects up here to Acts, and this one goes back here to Romans, blah, 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 right? <laughs> I knew that I knew everything mm -hmm. about it, right? Um, and I always give this example. You know, if you're walking down a hallway and you're like 50 feet from the door at the end and, and the door is open and you're looking into the other room, you can only see this much of the room. It's whatever the width of the door is. But you're because you're 50 feet from it, your line of sight won't allow anymore. If you take five steps forward, how much more of that room can you see? Out of 50 feet, not much. Not much. Right, you're seeing until you're right up on it. But man, you've taken five steps forward. Think about all the ground you've covered. My God, what you now understand must be immensely more. It's not until you get all the way down in that room and you stop and you turn around and see that this is a three-story library. All this data that you, what what you have to master has now exponentially yeah. grown but you've gone so much further but you know relatively so much less and this i am convinced is the experience of people in the church experience of people online right people that haven't had the and i'm, and I'm not i'm trying to say that i was very very fortunate to have the experience to walk down that hallway and get all the way into that room. But I realize now how little I know, comparatively speaking. Now, I know a fuck ton more, right? <laughs> I 
I was but, waiting for it. But there's no way I'm going to be able to master all the data that's in this three-story library. You right? do know yeah. what you just did, though. You literally gave a story of Dunning-Kruger. Yes. You literally yes, yeah. told us yeah. sure. the Dunning-Kruger effect. Sure. It was just totally. a polite way of saying it because people don't like to hear that. We all have experienced... I mean, I'm sure that you did. Yeah. I know that I did. On that journey to that room... <laughs> You, you go through these stages. Well, I read a book. I read two books. Oh, boy. Th and this one came up with something I've never heard before. And yeah. it must be brilliant because it's, it's answering all the questions. And there's a really funny way of how people's uh, interpretive models seem to account for all the data points. Yeah. Because if you don't know what all the data points are, this model can seem to fit it. And that's the issue here. So when you when you read an article from 1983 and it's five pages long <laughs> and it says, look, six here's pages, and this gosh. right six pages. Sorry. And look, here's a chiastic structure that accounts for everything. Well, if you yeah. can't read goddamn Sumerian, right, or you can't read Akkadian yeah. or you haven't worked at these. Texts, Why latch onto that little article from 1983 then? Yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's just there's there's so much out there. And again, I was as guilty of this as anybody. But I just, I guess what I'm saying is, like, there's an anti-intellectualism out there. Yeah. And that anti-intellectualism, I think, comes from a place of, I, I don't want to feel insecure in what I know. I don't want to have to say, these people that have dedicated 15 years of their lives to grad school and have been doing this in the field for 20 years or 30 years or whatever, that, that, that they, they know more than I do about this. And I'm not going to be able to attain that level uh, unless I go do what it is that they do. Or I have some crazy high IQ and I'm in a very fortunate circumstance to be able to dedicate just tons and tons of time to reading. Um, and and the, the issue here, I think, is that bolstering this is the online access that we have to information that we don't actually know is not reputable. And if mm -hmm. you can read it somewhere, and it makes sense, and it fits the data points, and it sort of tickles your, your, you know, the, your your desire. Uh, that didn't make any sense as an analogy, <laughs> um, but it but it it satisfies the longing that you have to answer these. It's so easy to grab onto that because you don't know what's in that room. You just right. know this yeah. little bit that you see. I like that. I like I like that. Uh, Dennis McDonald. I did a recording with him. There was a four panel responding to some of his mimet mimetic work. Um, we had Stephen Boyce. We had uh, Eric Manning uh, from um, yeah. the oh, Christian right. Apologist yeah, channel. That's right. Yeah, then we had um, Tim McGrew, Tim McGrew, and then we had, um, I can't remember the fourth person. Oh, um, Thad. Thad, yeah. yeah. And so um, Dennis responded, yeah. and he saw the whole stream that they did. We did a response video later on, but this was while I was in California recorded, and he says, Derek. I'm going to say this very kindly. Dennis is one of the most soft, humbling guys. If you talk to him, he wouldn't hurt a fly. In fact, I, I hope he sticks around for another 20 years mm. because it's sad. This guy's that he's been he's been even in academia not treated the way he could be, mm. believe it or not. But the problem is what he knows is a skill. There was a time in the 70s and 60s that they were actually training a mixture of New Testament and classicist. To learn the Greek and go back into Homer and actually learn this material, New Testament scholars aren't told or trained to read this stuff. This is something that he has a specialty on, and it's a very, very niche specialty, which puts him already on the outside of most New Testament scholars. But mm -hmm. he said, "Derek, I'm going to say this about them, and I don't mean this disrespectful, but they are intellectual anti-intellectuals." Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it hit. Yeah. I was like. Ooh, because yeah. they're smart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they are working against the data, yeah. the evidence. Yeah. The, the, they're trying to do something rather than work with what scholarship yeah. is actually saying here. You know, it did. And I, I, I am benefiting from that. But a lot of people don't have that luxury, right? They have to go out into the workforce. They have families. They have to take care of them. And they get to a place where it's like, I... I I'm not going to be able to have the money, have the time to go get a master's degree and then go get a PhD. Like, I'm just not going to have time to do it. But I want to know, right? I want to be 
somebody that is an authority on this. So what do I do? Well, like, I think people just say, well, if I just, if I just read, you know, the right people, or if I, if I just, you know, get under the the right scholar on YouTube or something, and then I read what they tell me, mm-hmm. like, then, then I can, I can, I can battle with the best of them. Mm-hmm. And it can, it, it's a, it can seem that you really have a command of the data. It can feel like you have a command of the data and you just, you just don't, you've only moved a couple feet down that hallway. You just don't know it. And uh, so then it builds this, this confidence that then you hear people say when they get in frustrating circumstances, Oh, so-called Dr. Bowen, <laughs> so-called Dr. Davis. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and that's where that, that sort of thing. More comes recently from. on Blur user has been uh has been accusing me now of of what is it it's uh it's my it's my my white western elitist historicist bias like i wow. i i <laughs> i don't even know what to do with that like in uh, what context uh, as 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 a means of of uh basically of of saying this is what historical criticism is 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 it's 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 an attempt to it's taking a modern method and and ham fistingly you know applying it to these ancient texts as a means to to try and understand them but can't possibly because it's not getting inside the i think inside the milieu or inside that but it is it's a it's a form of this this kind of uh, intellectual anti-intellectualism yeah. yeah where you you apply a label to someone you know liberal scholars yeah, like a poisoning or, the wells or, yeah, yeah it's a it's a way of uh of i i think dismissing uh the yeah. stuff that that you you either that either frightens you or you don't understand yeah or or both right um you know, because it it's, you know, I just when I when I read stuff like that, I just shake my head and I'm just like, you you just you just have no, you just have no idea yeah. how hard scholars work to to try and understand the literature on its own level. Yeah, right. Um, which, which is what we're doing. Like that's the, you know, maybe that's that's another way to understand the difference between uh, between critical scholars and apologists. You know, apologists are trying to make sense of the literature, the 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 Bible within within this context that that works for them in the here and now. Right. Scholars are trying to make sense of the biblical texts in their world yeah and you have to of course this means you have to you you have to employ techniques that have techniques and methods that have been developed over you know hundreds of years uh in order to in order to access this stuff uh and and understand it as as best as we can but at the heart of it that's the goal is to try and get to the point of the literature in its own time in its own place and to make this accessible and understandable to people in the modern world yeah and uh you know i think that that's one of the one of the things that um i think surprised me the most when i when i i the the deeper i got into uh my own critical studies of the bible was just how weird and strange the text actually is in this world really is because i never because from in my own upbringing in my own uh modern christian context i was always told that this is this is something that was written for me now so it's got to be understandable in the here and now right uh and and the thing that that just blows my mind more and more as i dig into this literature is just how far away we are yeah for here and now from 
what these texts are and where they came from and what they were, you know, for whom they were written and, and the purposes for the, for, for whom they were written. It's, it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those mind blowing things. Yeah. I mean, comments like this, mm-hmm. and I noticed cause my computer gives you like a little corner notification. I just glanced over for a second. You oh, will hate it up. when God has the last laugh. He purposefully put just enough there to make you go the way you want. The game has rules called faith. This is the other thing that I find, um, and this could go a completely different direction, but maybe not. Um, I think there's a security in apologists, certain apologists, uh, when it comes to this apocalyptic idea. Because like I wrote that chapter in that, um, in that Rutledge volume on violence and genocide and like evangelical morals and, and how they wrestle with morality in the Old Testament. And one of the things that I talked about is, and I see this online and you just gave an example of it. So many apologists are not only looking to deal with these passages about violence and genocide in a way that allows them to sleep at night. Instead, uh, much worse, they're taking pleasure in these passages. Like, uh, I know you guys have seen this video, I'm sure, but, you know, Skylar Fiction and I did an interview with a, a young man. Oh, yeah. And Skylar said, you know, something to him like, so if God... You know, if God commanded you to do away with a small person, mm-hmm. um, would you do it? Or no, he said, would it be moral? And the guy said, yeah, um, I would do it if God commanded me to do it. Yeah. And he said, you you would off yeah. a small person if God commanded to? And the guy said, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And, of course, I put the Kool-Aid, you know, yeah oh yeah you know on top of it but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> oh my gosh but i mean think about that it, it's it's this it's this apocalyptic mindset because look we're the persecuted group we're the ones that are suffering we're the ones that are having to take it on the chin right now but but just you wait just yeah. you wait yep when You'll god comes yours. back yeah i mean i'm thinking of someone that we won't mention their name very specifically now, you know, like a staircase uh, up to when Abraham offered the staircase. Um, you know, like this person I, I, is looking forward to putting his foot on our necks. You yeah, know? if you go, if you want to get a, a chuckle, but also see how deep this goes, um, love letters from Christians um, to Richard Dawkins. If you have not watched that... Wow. We'll have to watch it after we're done recording here so you can see. It's very short, but it is the funniest and saddest thing at the same time. You're laughing because you're going, how ridiculous. You'll see why. Yeah. But there are moments yeah. where you're going, these are real people who really yeah. wrote Richard Dawkins this, and yeah. they're Christians. Yeah. And yeah, it's like, well, God's hate works for my hate here on this. And if it... Even if it's not a political thing, and oftentimes it is, it's something social or ethical or political or something like that, sometimes it's just heaven and hell. Like, yeah. right here, mm-hmm. they're not happy with the fact that James Tabor literally says that the New Testament gospel is contradicted and there's a problem. Yeah. Somebody's not telling the truth or somebody's being inaccurate or something, and that person got so mad. You will hate, you all hate it when God has the last laugh. Ha, 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 It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. is going on here? It's, Great God, you know? Yeah. And that and that's the thing, like when people bring up like passages like Psalm one thirty seven and you know the lament and you know happier is happy as he who bashes your you know your baby heads, heads against rocks. the rocks. Yeah. Like and, and the apologetic standard apologetic is oh look this is a lament, this isn't God coming this command. Like why this is a like why this is a thing throughout the Psalms, like this is this is the intent of God is to to bring about these violent acts, right? This is not an anomaly. It's just a, a very uh, like s- straightforward way of picturing it. But certainly that's not a that's not an idea that Yahweh's standing back going, what? No, <laughs> my gosh, we I didn't never say be kids. so violent. 
Yeah. Um, and, 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 but the, the thing is, I, I think that that mindset, again, particularly in the apocalyptic genres, you, you can't help but read through Revelation as a Christian and feel like, yeah, oh, yeah. one of these days, one oh, of these yeah. days, Alice, you know, and um, that was a really bad example to use. I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, like I, I, I said at the end of that article, um, even though apologists will say, look, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay, right? Um, there are two things that always stand out to me. One, when you know that it's coming, it can be very difficult, and it was for me, for a Christian to not think of ways to help the process along. Yeah, right. Right? And secondly, if you know that your Lord hates a certain group of people and will destroy them if you were to come back right now, it's pretty easy to hate that group as well, even if it's in and your to own want heart. to destroy yeah. them yeah. too. Yeah, I That's mean, look the, at yeah. It, I the the terrifying thing in this is is so much of this literature. What apocalyptic literature is is its literature of persecution. Yeah, it's it's written under conditions of duress and trauma. The terrifying thing about this is that this has become reified literature, yeah. and now it's it's. It's this this literature that was written under duress and trauma, but now in the hands of the powerful. Yes, exactly. The that's the scary part. Precisely. That's the terrifying. That's the terrifying piece in all of this. It's interesting you say that. This is why I love scholarship. This is why I like secular academia. Even my investigation into Islam and, and understanding the cultural milieu, the history, what's going on in Arabia, the whole nine. There's a scholar named Stephen. Um, no, uh, Stephen, and I can't remember his last name, but anyway, he's written on this whole um, apocalypticism in the time of Muhammad and how empires were... The, the new apocalypticism by then, according to what he's arguing, is pretty much a race for whichever empire's winning is the one God's going to favor and give like at the end. So now it's not a, wow. I'm the weakest and God's going to vindicate us. It's a race for human involvement to, to become the, the most supreme empire so that God then favors you and you win. Yeah. And so that's why the conquest uh, makes a lot of sense yeah, in sure. early Islam conquest yeah, sure. and why these nations are battling it out over and over from the Persians over here with uh, the Seleucid, and then also mm -hmm. dealing with um, Constantinople, the remaining part of Rome that is even there in the Roman Catholic or the Catholic Church period, because there's yeah. various sects arguing. But like, it's interesting what you just said, because today you can take that to like Bush and the things he was saying when they went when we went to the Middle East with tanks Boy. and the whole nine. Like yeah. he's thinking, yeah. we're the sword of God. Yeah. yeah. No, there was a very interesting uh, back in I think it was two thousand, it was it was probably two thousand five, two thousand six, maybe a little bit before that. Um, the Society of Biblical Literature used to uh, used to publish a uh, an online forum, and in one of them uh, they featured uh, I think it was four or five papers by scholars where they specifically uh, pulled apart. Uh, Bush's speeches and and uh, analyzed them on the basis of uh, the the apocalyptic language that he was employing mm. Wow and it, you know sh just pointing it you know directly pulling this stuff straight out of out of the Bible and looking at it in in the context in which Bush was speaking and saying look this is the there is a this is a mission statement uh this is about this is about being exactly that uh the 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 sword of god yeah in this uh in this battle against uh against the forces of darkness when i think about what you said uh about you know apocalyptic literature starting off with the the oppressed mm -hmm. Right. And it being this hang on just a little bit longer. You can make it survive. Don't give in. Um, and then it, it going into the hands of the of the of the powerful. I mean, it really is akin to if like a little kid is getting bullied by a 13 year old right out on the docks. And all of a sudden that that 13 year old boy finds himself in his admiral father's battleship. 
right? And and they're looking down <laughs> yeah. from the battleship on this 13-year-old bully and they're going to blow him up. Yeah. You know, it's like, whoa, like it, it, it's it's different now, right? <laughs> You're not the 13-year-old. You're the 13-year-old with the battleship owning father, yeah. right? Like this is this is different. And um and, and, and the thing is, it's that 13-year-old boy thinking, or that, that younger boy, boy being thinking. picked on, thinking that um, he's still in that position. He actually believes he's being persecuted and wants to enact all yeah. the power that he can get behind him. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, he, he's the one in charge. And I'm sure there's several more things that, uh, you know, when we do stop this recording that come to mind that we run into examples, ideas that just Christian apologetics, and and we are emphasizing Christian, but that's because we all three were, okay? This does not limit itself, okay? Just so everybody knows, this can go for Jewish apologists, this can go for Muslim apologists, this can go for any and all apologists, really, technically, um, that are out there trying to defend their conclusions that they're starting with. And Richard C. Miller, when I interviewed him not too long ago in California, he said something interesting that goes along with this intellectual stuff you're talking about with the education. And he's like, Derek, there's, it's not honest in terms of like getting to the, the grip thing yeah. we're talking about in the previous video. It's not honest conclusions, he said, because... Where they're making their converts or, you know, at Christian camp, a summer yeah. camp. They're yeah. making them in the local church. The, right. You're not, there is not this mass conversion as Gary Habermas yeah. was confronted by Pine Creek the one time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't watched him in a long time. But on that episode, he's like, Gary, can you give me this list of academics who were skeptical atheists who approached this material and then were convinced? Yeah. Oh, my God. Still, uh, the evidence is just so obvious. Still waiting for the list. Yeah, like, why is that? Yeah. And, you know, it was, it's not that. It's something else. Well, I think it's worth pointing out that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm 50 years old, so I, I remember a time before you could, you could just go and buy whatever book you wanted on Amazon. The place where Christian apologetic books were sold was in Christian bookstores. The people who were buying them, yeah. the people who bought... William Lane Craig and Lee Strobel and Robbie Zacharias and some of the, and Josh McDowell, these old school guys, they're Christians. Yeah. When they would go on speaking tours, they spoke in churches. Uh, Josh McDowell uh, came to to uh, Vancouver uh, once when I was when I was still in Bible college. And, uh, and I went to go see him. And he was in a church. Wasn't at a university. Yeah. Uh, these guys aren't... I, I mean, they are... It's, it's much easier for, for these guys now, I think, because of, because of the internet and because of the, 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 the global reach that, that that has provided. But in the old days, it was all... It, it was a ghetto. It all stayed in-house. You sold your books in the Christian bookstores to Christians, and you went on your speaking tours at the churches to talk to Christians. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. There's so much more we could get into. No doubt. And uh, thank you.